we're thrilled to welcome Becky Furtiher, investment partner at Andreessen Horowitz, to the show today. Becky, thank you once again for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Chris. This is really fun. No, oh, let's kick things off. Becky, can you share a brief personal intro with us? Absolutely. Um, so let's see where to start. I I am a Midwesterner, born and raised. Um, I was born in Evanston, Illinois. Um, my dad was in grad school at Northwestern, which is how we ended up there. Um, we moved to Madison, Wisconsin when he took a faculty position there. Um, so I grew up in middle school and in high school in Madison and was lucky enough to be in an ecosystem around a great public university and a lot of kind of science and, and research. Um, I then uh, was lucky enough to, to get into MIT for undergrad, where I studied course seven or biology um, and kind of continued to catch the uh, biology bug. I then moved across the country to start my PhD at UC Berkeley, where I studied eukaryotic gene regulation in Barbara Meyer's lab. Um, post my PhD, I did a postdoc at Genentech in Peter Jackson and Jenny Lill's groups, where I studied ubiquitin cancer cell biology and proteomics. Um, post my time at, at Genentech, um, I moved a very short distance uh, within South San Francisco and started a scientist role at Amgen R&D, working on technology development for cell and gene therapies. I then had the opportunity to transition within Amgen and to start a role in business development where I worked in the search and evaluation group as well as, as uh, transactions uh, to set up partnerships between Amgen's research folks and therapeutic platform companies like, like those companies that I invest in today. Um, so now I'm an investment partner on the A16Z bio and health team. Thank you for that background on yourself. Can you give us a brief intro to A16Z for those who might be unaware? <laughs> Absolutely, happy to. Um, so A16Z as a firm was um, founded in 2009 by Mark Andreessen and, and Ben Horowitz and began as a tech-focused venture capital firm, as many of you are probably aware. There are entire books and multi-hour-long podcasts uh, going into detail around the founding of A16Z, so I won't belabor that. Um, but I will touch a little bit on A16Z Bio, uh, now known as A16Z Bio and Health. Mm -hmm. So Vijay Pandey, um, who was a professor of biophysics at Stanford and is the founding general partner of A16Z Bio, Vijay really saw a unique opportunity to invest in people and invest in companies that are building at the interface of technology and biology. And so in 2015, uh, raised a dedicated fund to back precisely this type of founder, this type of person who approaches biology from engineering principles. Um, today at A16Z Bio and Health, we're investing out of our fourth fund. This is a $1.5 billion vehicle that enables us to back a really broad range of companies spanning areas such as tools and technologies uh, that can fundamentally change the future of life science research, um, technology-enabled therapeutic platform companies, companies building in synthetic biology, both in therapeutics and outside of therapeutics, digital health and diagnostic companies, uh, companies building in fintech for healthcare, companies that are developing technologies that can enable care delivery, and um, healthcare, more, health, healthcare more broadly. So if I had to think of how to like boil down our core philosophy at A16Z Bio and Health, I'd say we invest in and we build with world-class founders that are transforming the way that we discover, develop, access, pay for, and experience health. Um, and by health, that might mean medicines, that might mean healthcare. It might mean the food that we eat. It sounds like, quite honestly, you're doing it all. And that's uh, phenomenal. You get to see so many aspects of life science and healthcare application and really help shape that journey. And on the topic of journeys, before we dive too deeply into A16Z, we'd love to discuss yours and your journey to venture. So professionally, as you mentioned, it all seemed to start where uh, when you pursued biology in undergrad at MIT. And then dove a little bit deeper yourself in your PhD at UC Berkeley. But taking it a step back into the beginning, what first brought you to bio? Why, uh, I think you said section seven. 
Yeah, so the answer to that question actually requires me to go a little bit earlier. Um, I was very lucky in my, I guess this has been my sophomore year of high school. Um, I took a biology class with this brand new uh, biology teacher. Her name was uh, Catherine Eilert uh, at Middleton High School in Wisconsin. And Catherine was uh, straight out of, uh, you know, her studies. Uh, she was very kind of new and hip on the newest of biology and biotech and wasn't wasn't teaching old school biology. She was um, really kind of thinking about how to teach students what the newest innovations were happening in the space and make it very relevant and real for them. Um, I totally fell in love with biology during that class and um, was really interested in ways to make that real, real for me and ways to get involved. Um, Catherine happened to have a connection at one of the local biotech companies in the Madison area, Promega. And she spoke with one of the scientists there and was able to make a connection for me that enabled me during my junior and senior years of high school to spend part of my day actually interning at Promega. So I spent my mornings at Promega and then I spent my afternoons uh, doing traditional high school. And it was um, the most amazing experience that I could have ever had. It, they really gave me the opportunity to just learn and explore and tinker and um, ha have, you know, the ability to ask questions and answer them and learn what research was all about. Um, and so I very much credit her and the experience that I had at Promega for giving me that initial um, bug for biology and for giving me the motivation to then pursue it throughout undergrad and grad school. I absolutely love that. A really strong example honestly of the way a key teacher especially in the early yeah. age will make such a difference and the trajectory of not only your path but i mean now that you're influencing others think of how many startups are benefiting from uh, the extra mile she took that's phenomenal um and so continuing on that and as you described you jumped from your phd to a postdoc at genentech before joining amgen where you were focused on uh, advancing novel cell gene therapy technologies and so you'd experienced, it sounds like, working in industry already in high school. But from grad school, what, uh, what led you to pharma? Yeah, so when I started my grad studies, I really, uh, I thought I wanted to be an uh, academic professor. Um, I, I would say within a couple of years, it became pretty clear to me that that wasn't what I wanted to do. And that really was because I realized a couple of things. I realized that I loved diversity in science and that what brought me a lot of joy was learning new areas constantly um, and thinking about how to connect the dots between all of those different areas of science. Um, I also realized that it really was motivating for me to work on topics that were translationally relevant. And I felt like both of those things were probably better done in um, industry than in academia. That being said, um, I didn't feel like I was done learning yet, and there was still quite a bit that I needed to do to develop myself as a scientist and develop um, my ability to really um, push forward science, be innovative, and um, think about how to ask new questions and address them scientifically. And that was how I ended up doing a postdoc at Genentech. So I tell um, people all the time who are kind of at this crossroads and say, hey, I'm wrapping up my PhD. I don't know what to do next. I'm thinking about industry, but I don't want to necessarily take a lab tech job. What do I do? I think postdoc programs at um, places like Genentech, Amgen, Novartis, you know, Merck, uh, a wide variety of companies these days do, uh, do postdocs within industry. It really is this amazing opportunity for you to have the best of both worlds, to continue to learn and have the ability to um, do publishable work um, and leave doors open, while also getting a real world taste of what um, biotech and pharma and drug development are like. And if you find the right mentors to work with, many people will be willing to let you, you know, really be a fly on the wall, if not a participating member of active um, drug discovery and development project teams. That sounds like a phenomenal opportunity to get started. And it also sounds like even then, uh, in some ways, your transition from the bench to BD at Amgen was foretold, as you're talking about this intersection between translation and considering a lot of different scientific areas. 
Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, that's a, a good point. I think I was always interested in the variety of different roles that there were that, that exist um, within biotech and pharma. And I found it so exciting that there were many different places for scientists to play um, meaningful, impactful roles um, outside of, of traditional R&D roles. That being said, when I actually made the transition into BD, I wasn't actively looking. I actually really loved my R&D role. I loved the team that I worked on. Um, yeah, I, I got along and still get along very well with my um, uh, manager that I worked with within that, that R&D role. Um, but as I said, I think I've always been innately very interested in the startup ecosystem and, mm -hmm. you know, was continually looking for innovative science being developed in academia or at small biotechs that could complement the research that our team was doing at Amgen. I always thought that doing science within kind of a, a siloed bubble and not being aware of or collaborating with externally developed science would just be such a, a narrow view of the world and such a missed opportunity. So because of that kind of innate interest, um, I got to know the BD team at Amgen really well because I was you know, often coming to them with, hey, this is a cool company to look at. Hey, have you heard of this academic lab? They're doing really neat science. Let's set up a collaboration. So when a role opened up on the technology platform uh, business development team, I think it was just a, a really natural fit. fit. And um, when they approached me with the opportunity, um, I jumped at, at that opportunity. Um, I think that, you know, I was really excited to develop this whole other side of me also. Um, I, I love people and I was always kind of that scientist who would volunteer to go to the conference, to give the talk, to, you know, uh, meet with uh, other R&D teams and chat science. And so I oftentimes felt like myself and my skills and my interests weren't necessarily being fully utilized within a traditional R&D role. Um, so I was really pumped to get to like develop that other side of me and, and learn the business of biotech. And you brought some of that business, it sounds like, with you from Amgen to Andreessen uh, after about four years there. So did you view this at that point almost as a natural extension of your career where you're interested in this early stage of science, you're interested in startups and seeing and exploring and supporting what's out there and also people. And as I think everyone uh, listening knows, venture is effectively a service role, right? Uh, we're here to connect with and support people. And so... I would, I would just be curious, I guess, um, how you thought about it then and maybe how BD informed your journey into venture. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think um, venture was never a specific goal of mine that I was working towards. And for a large portion of my career, I don't even think, well, I would even say I, 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 it wasn't even on my radar as like a potential place to go. And um Oftentimes people will ask me, uh, you know, when I talk to junior folks who are thinking about getting into venture, are there things you could have done during your career to speed up the process of getting a VC role? And I say, that's so the wrong way to think of it. There is nothing in my career that I would have changed because all of the pieces of the puzzle of my career that I've done have been important to bringing me to where I am today um, and to making me the type of investor that I am today. That being said, I'd say that like, over time in my BD role at Amgen, I realized that the types of companies that I found to be most compelling, um, very early stage technology platform companies, um, these were very difficult to execute partnerships with because they were so early and the science was still so risky. Um, so, you know, by definition, that is exactly the place where early stage venture plays. Um, mm -hmm. And you're not only able to place bets in these early places, um, but you're able to partner really closely with the founders and help increase the probability of their success in any way possible. As you said, it's, it's, a, it's a service role. Um, so I think in retrospect, as someone who not only loves early stage science, but also really enjoys people and who just loves getting to continually learn across a wide variety of different subject areas, it does feel in retrospect like it was a natural extension and I feel incredibly lucky to have this job but if you would have asked me that several years ago I that is not something I was working towards or saw as a 
continuum of the career track that I was on. All in, in that case, then I would almost ask, how did you end up where you are? Um, if so, you weren't specifically pursuing venture which I suppose means you weren't necessarily actively recruiting with a bunch of different venture firms. Um, but as was it very much serendipitous that you ended up at A16Z as opposed to joining maybe a corporate pharma-based uh, venture team or another firm? It's a good question. So um, the venture role definitely did not just fall up in, in my lap. I think um, while early on, I was not specifically looking in that direction, as I got to the place in my BD role, as I was, I was kind of saying, where I realized that, hey, the types of deals that I want to do, the types of companies that I'm compelled uh, to work with, the types of founders that I want to support are maybe too early stage and a little bit too risky for, you know, pharma BD. Mm -hmm. I was uh, very lucky in that my office at Amgen happened to be next door to the office of um, Janice Nave, uh, who led Amgen Ventures at the time. And she and I became very close and I got to really see the work that she was doing within that corporate venture role, um, investing in companies. And, you know, oftentimes got to work with her maybe on some of those earlier stage opportunities that were too early to transact on a BD role. Um, but, you know, we could invest in them. We could form a relationship with them. Maybe selfishly, we could turn it into a BD opportunity down the road. Mm -hmm. As I worked more and more with her, I realized that venture was something that I was very interested in and that was very appealing to me. Um, and so I did start to do kind of more digging around and saying, okay, what is this venture thing? What's the difference between traditional biotech VC versus uh, more of a tech bio firm versus corporate venture? Uh, can I get to know people and understand what it is that they do? And, you know, do I think that it's something that I would like also? Um, I did consider, you know, staying within corporate venture. I think ultimately a lot of the restrictions that you have from a corporate BD job play over to some degree within corporate venture as well. You're, you're restricted to some degree in the types of companies that you can invest in. There needs to be, you know, strategic alignment uh, mm -hmm. oftentimes with that pharma company. And so, you know, I did look at a wide range of venture roles across corporate venture, um, more traditional institutional biotech VC, as well as tech bio firms. Ultimately, uh, joining A16Z, I have to say, at the end of the day, was a really easy choice for me. And that's primarily, I'd say I can boil it down to three things. Um, number one, the people. The people that I work with matter so much to me. Um, when I work with people that I you know, not only look up to, but enjoy, it makes work more fun and it makes me do better at my job. Um, not only did I find the A16Z team to be incredibly smart, forward thinking, inspirational people, but they're super fun and they don't take themselves too seriously. Um, the other thing I'd say is that the team's diversity really stood out to me. Of all the teams that I met with, um, A16Z had this natural, amazing diversity within the team. And that, that spoke volumes to me about the firm. Um, the other thing I'd say is that, you know, A16Z clearly thinks differently and doesn't follow the crowd. And I loved that. I loved that there was, it was not just a um, biotech focused firm, but that there was a large diversity in thinking and interests in backgrounds in expertise. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, I think, A16Z was and isn't a place of building. And so, you know, being in a building stage um, and getting to join a firm where you can have a lot of opportunity to contribute in a very meaningful way and help shape the, the future of the team, the future of the firm uh, was incredibly um, compelling to me. Uh, it scratches that dual itch. Not only do you get to see and explore and work with some exciting people, but a little bit of entrepreneurship and ownership off, often goes a long way. So in that case, then, do you have, and I know this wasn't necessarily planned and um, you wouldn't change your background in any way, but by the same token, do you have any advice for those maybe in pharma today who are considering exploring uh, VC and getting into building at some point down the line? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in general, when I chat with folks and people ask me for advice as to how to 
pivot into any new, new career, whether that's BD to VC, whether that's an R&D role into B, BD, you know, you name it. One of the pieces of advice that I always give is find ways to start doing parts of that job that you want today. So for example, let's say that you're, you know, thinking of making the pivot from uh, BD into VC. Start networking with VCs today. VCs love to chat with pharma BD people. Um, we love to understand we what do. areas their company <laughs> is interested in. We do, we do. Which I don't think I realized actually when I was in BD. Um, mm -hmm. We like to understand what needs they have. We like to understand what potential partnership opportunities might be possible for their portfolio companies. Uh, we like to understand where the sector in general is headed um, so that can kind of inform and and uh, our diligence and our uh, areas of, of investment thesis. Um, so you can start there, right? Mm -hmm. And then when you see interesting science that's too early for a BD transaction, share it with those VCs. They'll appreciate the deal flow. And then they'll start to see how you think um, and get to know you. Um, start to develop your own theses on what's exciting, what's investable, um, and considering discussing these during those chats with those VCs that you respect. Um, maybe you just chat verbally. Maybe you, you know, perhaps uh, consider putting out some sort of content via blog or via Twitter. I know many corporate pharmas like discourage that type of activity, but maybe you can. And then people will see you as already being competent in the role that you want. And I think we'll be much more likely to take a chance on you um, in something new. I'm gonna very much echo everything you said and also put an open call. If anyone in Pharma BD ever <laughs> wants to chat and share very uh, early stage technologies they're excited by, please contact Becky and I. Uh, Absolutely. I know we would both love. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I always thought at the time that like I was being, that, that they weren't interested in speaking with me and I didn't necessarily have anything to contribute. And now I look at the other side of the coin and I realize that that couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah. No, and it's a conversation never hurts. And I think in most cases, people always enjoy it, especially if they're sitting on, you might call it the other side of the table, but it's where um, we're all sitting around the same table is probably the way I would phrase it instead. And I love so, that. Uh, jumping back a little bit more and focusing now a little bit into A16Z uh, in the bio and health space. And I loved your phrasing earlier. You said you seek to uh, back world-class founders who are changing the way we experience health in medicines and healthcare, maybe even in the food space as well. And so you've shared a little bit more about uh, what bio and health means at Andreessen. And you yourself in, uh, on the healthcare team focus on early stage companies building technology platforms for therapeutic discovery and development. So knowing that there are all these different areas A16Z invests in, uh, Maybe it's uh, too broad a question, but how how does the firm develop its various investment theses? Yeah, it's a great question. I think investment theses like science are continually in flux, continually being developed, being refined. We're learning new things. There's never an answer, which is in part what I love about science is that you never, you're never done. Um, there's always more to learn. There's always deeper to go. Um, in general, investment theses come up from areas of our own team's expertise, discussions that we have with our networks, with our portfolio companies, um, places that we see unmet need in the market, uh, combined with technology innovation that we see happening that could uniquely enable those white spaces. Mm -hmm. um, Again, if we kind of go back to like that pharma BD discussion, you know, a place that I often think about is places both that I as a BD person and then in those relationships that I have with um, current BD folks in pharma, trying to understand what the needs within pharma is, I think is such a, an interesting place to develop investment theses around because um, ultimately, especially for most early stage biotech companies, their initial go to market will likely be via a pharma partnership rather than going all the way through FDA approval, right? So I think yep. thinking about it from that term, from that framing is oftentimes um, helpful. You know, in terms of uh, where we are to 
day. Uh, you know, I don't think A16Z isn't a firm that has a concrete defined list of these are our investment thesis and this is where we invest within because we're continually developing that, that out. But I can surely hit on, on, on a couple of themes on the bio side that we've invested in recently and, and continue to see opportunity around. Um, one of them is, you know, data, machine learning, and engineering meets bio. So kind of the core thesis that we started with um, at A16Z. So that could be companies that are developing predictive algorithms for small or large molecule design. That could be companies that are training machine learning models uh, to detect the presence of cancer uh, or other diseases early from blood biomarkers. Um, that could be companies that are using big data and machine learning to identify regulatory sequences that could drive cell-specific gene expression. Mm -hmm. um, that, that could be companies that are segmenting and enrolling patients in better designed clinical trials. The list goes on and on, but that's a area that we're always interested in that we have strong conviction in and we want to see every company building in that space. Um, another place that we've done a lot of investing recently and where I, I have personal interest is in new therapeutic mod modalities that are de facto designed to be programmable. So companies that are taking advantage of the very modular nature of biology to engineer medicines in a programmable way. Examples could be genetic medicines like mRNAs, um, gene editing, or cellular reprogramming. But I think another area within that pro programmable medicine space that we're really excited about is this newest wave of programmable versions of old school modalities. So mm -hmm. for example, um, heterobifunctional small molecules like Dubtax being uh, developed by one of our new portfolio companies, Vicinitas. We think that a number of different technology advancements that are happening today are creating an opportunity for essentially what I see as like a second coming of small molecules and biologics. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm super excited to meet entrepreneurs that are building in these spaces. And I would be curious then, as you think about some of these spaces and as we talk about, and as you we were saying earlier, uh, Pharma BD partnerships and how sometimes the first engagement a company might have in terms of what you might call go to market is uh, with a pharma company. Would you have any thoughts around evolving um, business strategies and how a company might as they're developing these new platforms, uh, engage and best engage with a pharma company early? Yeah, that's a really good, great question. I think, um, first of all, I love the idea of evolving business models. I think um, today I'm concerned oftentimes that there is too much of a requirement for companies to become a full stack therapeutics company. I understand that um, that's where a lot of the value is today, that that is where, you know, the later stage uh, investment markets and the public markets often put value, but I, I am worried oftentimes that that can kill early stage innovation. Mm -hmm. I would say, first of all, engage early, um, you know, make sure that you have enough that you can speak credibly, but this is a long time game. Uh, BD deals take a long time. Traditionally, I would say you should expect it should take at least a year from the time that you have that first non-confidential conversation till the time that you engage in or, or transact in an actual deal. So engage early. Um, be willing to give information. So many early stage companies are so worried about IP protection and um, their ideas being stolen, especially I would say in kind of the AI ML world, there's a lot of concern there. But if you don't give information, then you can't build credibility and you can't build relationships. So you have to give information to get. Um, and then this is a relationship game. At the end of the day, people do deals with people who they like, who they respect, who they think are smart and they want to work with. And so see this as a long-term relationship game um, and build those relationships early. Oh, let's build on that a bit. And I think that's all phenomenal advice, especially having a small uh, pharma BD background myself, not anywhere near as extensive, but timelines uh, can be longer than people might think. The pharma, the pharma pace is not the startup pace. And as much as um, I think they each have something to learn from each other, I think transacting is a place where they need to come and meet in the middle. So 
let's let's build a little bit on that. Uh, you and your team have made some incredible investments into companies such as Asimov and Dino, in, uh, Incitro and Nautilus, Scribe Therapeutics. Maybe if we could use one or more of these companies as examples, how do you think about separating the signal from the noise when evaluating companies? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, so I think I think fundamentally, we are looking for companies that are one tackling a big important question, mm -hmm. uh, where if they could solve it, like would the world care? Would it fundamentally make a difference? Um, and you know, two, where they have a differentiated technology enabled approach to solve that problem. Um, preferably one that allows them to continually learn to iterate on that technology to improve upon it over time where it's not stagnant in time. Yep. And three, where the founder is the best person to tackle this problem. So, you know, if we look at that list that you talked about, let's take Dino, for example. I think we would all agree today that gene therapy delivery is a big, important problem that's holding back the broad applicability of potentially life-saving therapeutic modality. Mm -hmm. If you solve delivery for gene therapy, people will care and it will be valuable. Um, so number one, check. <laughs> number two, Dino had a very unique strategy for solving this problem, generating massive, massive experimental data sets from very well-designed, controlled, high-throughput experiments such designs such that they could learn the genetic code, if you will, of AAV. Mm -hmm. They could ask the question of how does changing individual amino acids alter the structure, function, and activity of an AAV capsid? And this knowledge enabled them to predict new AAV sequences in a generative fashion that optimize for multiple different desired characteristics simultaneously. I think Dino is a true example of a design test build loop platform built with broad applicability and the ability to continually learn in mind from day one. And then number three, Eric Helsig is not only the scientific inventor of this technology, um, but he's also an incredibly compelling storyteller. He's an incredibly compelling leader. He's really great at company building. And so I think it was clear that he was the best person to do this. So, you know, it's kind of we're working through that framework. And then ultimately, I'd say separating signal from noise also requires you to have what we referred to as a, re a prepared mind. So mm -hmm. understanding a space deeply enough that you're able to recognize those special companies that check those boxes and the founders that check those boxes when you see them. I really love that uh, description of prepared mind. And couldn't agree more on Dino. We were lucky to have Eric on BIOS Builders. And I think that episode actually just came out this week. So oh, for anyone awesome. interested I in hearing it, yeah. more about the Dino story. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of... And I can't take credit for the prepared mind uh, <laughs> phrase. That's uh, A16Z before my time. I don't know who, whether it was Mark or Ben or someone else that came up with it, but not me. <laughs> we'll find out for the next episode. Okay. But <laughs> in, in the meantime, uh, do you have any recommendations speaking of founders? for founders who are reaching out to A16Z? Um, good question. I think, A, I would just say, like, we're really nice people who are really excited to meet you and Second really- the They are. <laughs> <laughs> and really thrilled to learn about your idea or your company. Um, it is never too early to engage and we love to just kick ideas around, even if it's ready before prime time. I can't tell you how many founders have told me, oh, I didn't reach out because, you know, I'm still in the iteration process and my deck isn't polished yet. I don't care about that. I just want to chat with science with you and maybe I can give you some sort of input that might help you during that process. Mm -hmm. um, we are super easy to find. We're all on LinkedIn, Twitter, email. Um, we're all pretty responsive and check all of those things. And um, every single founder who reaches out will get a response and we will look at the materials that you send. Um, so. Just reach out and say hi. That's a great open communication channel. Uh, and so now let's take this in a slightly different direction. But Andreessen also occasionally gets involved in the incubation of companies, so far as I understand, uh, with the recently out of stealth Ultima, I think, uh, top of mind. 
Can you tell us a little bit more about X A16's view, uh, A16Z's view on incubation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and one I would say that is very much uh, like everything else uh, evolving uh, at the firm. Um, I would say A16Z's core motion will likely always be more classic investing in existing companies. Um, there is, I think, something so meaningful about someone having, you know, someone believing so much in the idea that they are pursuing that they're willing to leave their full time job put all their eggs in that basket, jump off the cliff, however you want to say it, that is very meaningful and can't be understated, um, which is why we love to invest in, you know, founders who are building their own companies. That being said, sometimes there is science, particularly science coming out of academia, where there is no full-time founder, but the science has such clear potential and it's so compelling and so clear that it needs it needs to live outside of academia and it needs an incubation team. It needs some people who've done this before to get it off the ground, to license an IP, to build an early stage research plan and a business strategy to help shape a uh, strategy as to what applications could be most impactful for that science, um, to hire in team members um, and a number of other um, essential kind of company building activities. Mm -hmm. So I'd say in those select situations where the science is so compelling that it clearly deserves to be a company and in those places where preferably there is a motivated entrepreneurial scientific academic founder who wants to be involved, who's excited about, you know, getting dirty and, and being involved in the company and, and wanting to build a company with people, but maybe not full time, maybe they want to keep their academic role. Those are the places I think that we're oftentimes compelled to play more of a company incubation or creation role. Um, I would also say that in those cases, we particularly like to consider incubations as part of a strong syndicate where mm -hmm. all syndicate members bring complementary capabilities and we can all work together to build a company. Um, I think that's more fun. I think it's stronger for the company in the long term. Um, and I think it brings a variety of different uh, capabilities and expertise and perspectives that ultimately build a stronger company at the end of the day. Oh, I'm excited to see then what is incubated next, but building on that sort of support where you bring those different perspectives in together. And uh, I'd love to talk about uh, A16Z's platform of support for founders. So at Andreessen, what does being a good partner mean uh, to your portfolio companies mean to you? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, ultimately, I think being a, a good partner to portfolio companies, in my opinion, is the most important thing. Uh, it's the reason we're here and it's the way that you differentiate yourself and, you know, ensure the increased probability of success of the companies that you invest in. So to me, it means um, staying close enough to the company, to the science, so that I can help anticipate issues before they arise. Um, it means constantly looking out for ways to open doors and remove roadblocks for them. So that might mean hiring, scouting for BD opportunities, making introductions. Um, it means standing by them in the good times and stand by them in the hard times. I remember I had an Amgen manager at one point who told me that his role as a manager was to be the shit umbrella to make sure that uh, he protected me from the things that I didn't need to spend my time on while also opening doors and giving me opportunity and credit for the things that I was excelling in. And I feel like if you can adopt that same type of mentality as a venture partner, uh, you're probably doing it right. Um, at A16Z in particular, I think one of the things that's really unique about us and um, that drew me to the team is our operating model. Mm. So only about uh, on any given day, somewhere around a third to a fourth of our uh, large bio team is in investing like myself and the rest of the team is in our operating functions. And those are operating functions for our portfolio companies, not for us. I think this is a 
differentiator that enables us to be really excellent partners to our portfolio companies. So that looks like groups like um, technical and executive talent, folks who have worked for years and years in executive recruiting and in technical recruiting and have built massive networks of people that they know all the way from kind of the junior scientist and computational biologist level, all the way up to the CEO level. And they build those networks over time with the long game being that if we build these networks and we help people in their careers, maybe that's at a 6 d portfolio companies, maybe that's elsewhere. Over time, that karma will come back and it will benefit our portfolio companies and it will help us source the best talent at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, we have an incredible people practices team their job, you know, these are people who have worked in HR and um, company building for their entire life. And they understand those difficulties of going from zero to three and three to 10 and 10 to 30. What, what, how do you think about building company culture? How do you make decisions around HR? And um, how do you react when difficulties happen in the company um, culture wise or, or otherwise? and they can really be valuable advisors um, to our companies. We have a really fantastic business development team. I like love spending time with them because you know they just, I geek out on the types of things that they geek out on, um, but they get to spend their days day in and day out meeting with BD folks, strategy folks, therapeutic area heads um, at pharma companies, um, folks at payers and providers in the FDA, building these deep networks of those people who ultimately are going to be important for go to market for our portfolio companies, such that it, they can anticipate what are the needs of potential partners, um, who is exactly the right person to connect our portfolio company with, such mm -hmm. that we enhance the probability of success of a deal. Um, so they're, and, and they're also getting to work with our companies around strategy and thinking about how do we prioritize our own pipeline and because I think that's a question that, you know, when you think about business development, you, you have to think about your pipeline prioritization and what are we going to do internally? What do we do externally? Right. So it's a holistic question. Um, we also have a capital networks team and their job is essentially to make sure that our portfolio companies are thinking ahead for that next round of financing, whether that's venture financing, whether that's venture debt, whether that's an M&A opportunity or um, if IPO markets <laughs> ever open up again. Um, <laughs> They, they form deep relationships with downstream investors and, and can be incredibly impactful to our companies. So that's a sampling of the different types of operational um, capabilities that we build at A16Z that I think are, are really impactful, or I hope, I hope they are. I was going to say, talk about a very robust uh, uh, group just to be a sampling. That's incredible. And I might have to swing by someday and geek out with you uh, in the BD team because that's yeah. a lot of fun. You should come uh, meet them. They're, they're great. So as, as we think about the lengthy life cycles of healthcare and bio companies, and you touched on this, and clearly Andreessen has some uh, strong support networks for exactly this purpose, building the team and building the culture of a company uh, with intentionality can be really critical. And this is very specifically in sort of this tech bio intersection where you're seeing that increasing interdisciplinarity. And so I, I'd just be curious to think about how, how do you think about supporting uh, and interdisciplinary teams and assisting founders in building this sort of long lasting company culture? Yeah, man, that is such a, a hard but important thing. And something that I think you have to be very intentional about from day one. And I would say that's both uh, building interdisciplinary teams and building company culture. Um, as I mentioned, this is one of the areas that our people practices team spends a lot of time working on with our companies on. Um, look, I think at the end of the day, it all starts with leadership. The leadership of a company sets the company culture tone. If you start with an interdisciplinary leadership team, it will attract interdisciplinary teams underneath them, right? And so it's part of it is quite honestly setting the model and um, being the example. Um, being intentional means things like uh, writing down company values, sharing them openly, being willing to discuss and debate and admit, admit mistakes and evolve over time. 
Um, one of our portfolio uh, founders, uh, Sri Kusuri at Octant, uh, he had a saying, if I get this right, that, that I loved at one point that said something like, um, building, building culture is not a set of aspirations, but a set of hard choices that have benefits and consequences. And I think that's so true. It's not a set of words that you put on a wall, but it's daily choices that you have to make that are not going to be perfect. And so, you know, particularly in tech bio companies where you may have both lab scientists and computational biologists or software engineers, there can be this wide chasm, this divide that can grow over time in compensation and or in stature or glory. It can feel like haves and have nots. Um, so I think ultimately you have to be purposeful about that. You have to be fair. You have to be transparent. You have to be consistent. And preferably you have to be open so that there's nothing in the dark and um, everyone understands where they stand. Um, so I don't know, you know, ultimately how helpful that is, but those are kind of my thoughts on, on that very, very difficult um, task that founders have ahead of them. I'm going to make it even harder for you, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> by bringing up the importance and I think the focus as quite rightly it should be there today on things like inclusion diversity and equity uh, around founders around boards and around teams and so given that A16Z does everything from support companies in the incubation phase all the way through in a stage agnostic do you have any thoughts on how and I really and I can open this up uh, but as we as VCs or as people who uh, care about this question more broadly can support founders who have a million and 10 things to do on any given hour and a reminder of the course of a day, uh, but are seeking to incorporate DE&I into team building? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and thank you for bringing it up. It's a super important one, um, one that I care a lot about. Um, so again, you know, it's super difficult to build a team with diversity if diversity is not modeled at the top. Um, if we go back to like my, my career journey and looking at venture firms, I was very turned off by venture firms that I looked at where everyone at the top was an old white male. It just didn't model to me that this was something that they cared about. So starting from the top and making sure that you are purposefully looking for and, you know, hiring folks um, from the very top who represent that diversity that you want to implement throughout the company is really important. At the end of the day, you have to be purposeful and you can't change what you don't measure. Mm -hmm. So from day one, lay out goals and measure your progress against them. Uh, at, you know, one of our portfolio founders does this and at every board meeting, he reports a slide on the distribution of the company in a variety of different ways and what he's doing, what his goals are and what he's doing to get there. And that might not that. be the bottom line thing that the board cares about, but I love it. I mm -hmm. think that it is so meaningful. And by not only measuring it himself, but speaking publicly about it to the board shows the dedication and the importance that you're placing there. Um, again, I think like if we go back to Sri's quote that I had loved, I think you could repurpose the exact same words. You could say DEI -E is, is not a set of aspirations, but a set of hard choices that have benefits and consequences. So, you know, at the top level, are you making those hard choices? Are you, are you prioritizing building uh, a diverse board? What about your SAB? Is your SAB diverse? Mm -hmm. Are you explicitly communicating to recruiters that you expect to see diverse pools of candidates and that you won't you know, continue to hire them if you don't. What do your job descriptions look like? Do they do they describe a classic old white male Harvard grad, or do they leave room open for a diverse set of experiences? Um, one way that we support at A16Z our founders in DE and I is actually via our cultural leadership fund. So mm -hmm. this is a team that purposefully builds networks across culturally diverse groups of people. And, you know, they have the ability to increase diversity in both the founders that we invest in at A16Z, as well as tapping into talent networks for hiring at portfolio companies. So again, I think that's something that we have been purposeful about at A16Z, setting a model for our companies to be able to emulate. Oh, wow. And providing those resources to the founders in the same vein, that's incredible. 
So taking this in an entirely different direction, I'd love to dive into the topic more, but let's talk a little bit more, I guess, about catalyzing bio innovation, if we can call it that. And so from the beginning of your time in uh, bio broadly, but especially from your time at Andreessen, you've had a very future forward and almost tech enabled investment perspective as we think about tech bio companies and new therapeutic modalities and platform plays. And so what have you been seeing from founders, from uh, academia, from wh where is the green space? What is that next cycle of emerging technologies? I guess we'd just really love to hear what you're most excited by. Yeah. Um... So I'm excited by so many different things. It's hard to make choices. Um, first of all, I'd say I am always really impressed by the level of innovation, creativity, and hustles from founders across the board. And the worst part of my job is saying no to people who are incredibly smart, who have great ideas, who have spent their, their hard-earned time and money and life um, pursuing these ideas. And so, um, you know, I, I, I just will admit that. Um, that being said, uh, what are things that I'm seeing that I'm excited about? Um, one area that I'm really excited about is what I will call true precision medicine. And that is not, um, precision medicine in the, in the way of thinking about, um, drugging specific mutations in oncology, for example. What I'm thinking here is like medicines where the cells of activity are more precisely defined. So that might mean technologies that enable delivery to specific cell types that could be viral or non-viral systems, that could be peptide or antibody-like modalities that can, uh, in a very defined way, hone in on a specific cell subset. Set. That could be single cell sequencing technologies to identify the correct cell subset in the first place that you want to target and what are the molecular targets that could um, mark those cells. Um, that could mean instead, let's say, instead of delivery to a specific cell type, that could mean activity in a specific cell type. So can you control the specific subsites where you get activity? Can you do that via maybe um, engineered regulatory elements? Can you do that via programmable sensors that allow you to unlock therapeutic activity only in a specific combinatorial environment where a specific subset of factors are present. Um, those are the types, those are some of the things that I'm really interested in because I think that there are so many very compelling applications that require that level of um, cell or tissue um, specificity. Mm -hmm. So that's one area. Another area, and this is going to sound funny because it's not like super cool or sexy or new, but um, is pharma tech spinouts. So I believe having been someone in pharma R&D, that there is a massive amount of great science that's being done by scientists in pharma, much of which will like never see the light of day. Many pharma R&D scientists have side projects that they work on either because they're given that time to do it. I know Genentech gives scientists a certain amount of time to just kind of do passion projects. Um, mm -hmm. Some scientists just steal that time on nights and weekends. Um, <laughs> and much of that science will never get developed within pharma. And so I'm starting to see this a little bit, but would like to like put a call out for more of it. That there should be more encouraging of spinning out science from industry. And I don't just mean the deprioritized assets that have made it through and for whatever reason pharma put on the shelf. I mean, true innovation technology platforms, just like we spin that out from academia, we should spin that out from industry and give it the light of day to live, to breathe, to have support. Um, and to have a future. And I think we should do that in such a way that pharma encourages the scientists who did that work to get to leave and, and join that company if they want to. Yes, it will mean like losing one of maybe your best scientists, but if you set them free, they will get to like pursue that science and maybe they'll come back to you. Maybe you'll reacquire them. Maybe you'll partner with them and then you'll know someone on the other side and it'll be a meaningful collaboration because you're friends already and you trust each other. Um, so that's one area that I would love to see more, um, happening. Something I cannot help but, uh, emulate and really say I would love to see it more as well, especially considering yeah. there are some really phenomenal internal opportunities at pharma companies, innovation, uh, competitions. And like, I know we had it at AstraZeneca, but exactly as you said, 
leaders could be nervous about losing too much top talent if yeah. they assisted and enabled uh, too many spin-outs. And so it would be, and I am excited to see it happening more. Um, but putting a pin in that, I guess, before we come to a close, just a few rapid fire questions to cap things off. So first and foremost, what's coming next for A16Z? Oh, uh, what's coming next for A16Z? Um, we're growing. Uh, we're continuing to build our team, both on the investment side as well as our operational teams. Uh, we're continually uh, learning from our portfolio companies and iterating on those operating models that I talked about to ensure that we're building, you know, the uh, a team and a firm um, that can make the biggest impact at the most crucial moments for our companies. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I'll say is like, people ask me all the time right now, are we actively investing at the moment? And, you know, the answer is absolutely. There was a article that came out a couple weeks ago. I don't remember if it was endpoints or um, stat, but, you know, it was kind of the nine companies that had raised rounds of 30 million or more in the month of July. And four of them were A16Z bio and health companies. So we are absolutely active. We are absolutely investing in new opportunities. Um, so please, come to us and, and uh, don't be shy. Having been on both sides of that round table as a pharma, uh, in pharma and as an investor, and I feel like we've already started talking about this, but uh, what advice would you give pharma companies who are seeking to collaborate and engage at earlier stages of innovation? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, hmm. be honest with feedback. Um, don't just tell companies what you think that they want to hear to make them feel good about themselves. Give real feedback of what you'd really need to see in order to turn a no into a yes. Um, and they might just surprise you and achieve it. And then you'll have built rapport and confidence with them that they're able to receive feedback, to incorporate it, and to um, act on that and generate new data, right? So that's one thing I'd say. Um, and then ultimately just like be willing to take a chance on risky science. If it's a team that you res respect, a team that you have good rapport with that you think you could collaborate well with in an area that you see potential, like take more risk. I love both messages. Uh, and we've talked a lot about the professional here. Love to ask at least one personal question. How do you like to spend your free time? Um, Great question. Uh, I, I have two little kids. I have uh, two and eight year old girls. So I spend as much time as possible with them. Uh, they are a ton of fun and a, a, a total joy. Um, otherwise, I really love outdoor activities. I grew up in a family that backpacked for vacations instead of going to Disney World. And while that was the bane of my existence as a kid, and I was like, I just want to do normal things. Um, <laughs> as an adult, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. I learned to love nature from a really, really young age. And so um, in the winters, you will find me in Tahoe and other, where, other uh, you know, mountain, mountainous, uh, snowy places skiing. I'm an avid skier and snowboarder. And then uh, in the summers, you'll find me kiteboarding in the bay. Um, my partner is a very avid uh, kiteboarder. And um, while I, I'm not as good as him, uh, I really enjoy it. And um, it's like a very adventurous, fun thing to do uh, with free time. Oh, I definitely need, need a lesson on that. That's, I've seen it before. It looks so cool. <laughs> it's super cool. It's also slightly terrifying, which I think is also what makes it fun. So... <laughs> Uh, adrenaline sports are a great time as long as yeah. you're being safe uh, yeah. well any other closing thoughts shameless plugs um closing thoughts uh thank you this was incredibly fun and a really awesome opportunity it never um never ceases to amaze me what a warm collaborative ecosystem early stage biotech and um tech bio venture is so thank you um i would say we have a lot of super amazing portfolio companies uh, that are hiring at A16Z. Um, and so if you're interested in biotech, um, you can check us out at uh, portfoliojobs.a16z.com. Um, and like I said, reach out. Like I'm always happy to engage with people, whether you're interested in venture, company building, business development, or otherwise. Um, don't, be a, don't be a stranger, reach out. 
Thank you, Becky, for a really fun conversation and absolutely fantastic episode. I'm very grateful for your time. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. This was a ton of fun.